Uh, today uh, is our last, um, uh, I would say our last installment, if you may, uh, of our More Than a Children's Story series. Has this been a blessing to anyone? Have you enjoyed this for those of us who have been around? And what we've been doing is we've been taking some very famous scriptures and teachings throughout the Bible, characters throughout the Bible, uh, people who God used greatly that maybe for those of us who grew up in church, we hear, heard them in Sunday school, or maybe for those of us who might be new to faith or new to church, we might even be familiar with some of these stories as our world would use some of these stories as references. And we've been expounding upon and extrapolating deep truths that are in the text and that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us about. And so today, uh, as we conclude this, I want to go to... Um, a very, very famous teaching of Jesus. A very, very famous parable that Jesus teaches, that he uses, um, that, that I believe is so timely. It is a timely word for our church. It is a timely word for this region. It is a timely word for our nation. And uh, what the Holy Spirit has spoke to me about this week, about bringing us back to love, loving our neighbor. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to read what Dr. Luke um, observes, and he writes as he uh, observes this teaching from Jesus and this interaction that Jesus has with this religious lawyer. So if you have your Bible, let's go to Luke chapter 10. Uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 25. And um, in this uh, scenario, there's a religious uh, scholar, a religious lawyer who comes to Jesus and he asks him this question. He says, just then, a religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Because that's what lawyers do. They ask you questions to test you. And so he says, teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? It's interesting that we, we see that question here um, in, in from this religious lawyer. We also saw that question from a very rich young ruler that Jesus had an encounter with. Verse 26, so he, he answered, Jesus said, uh, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. So I see Jesus here, he goes, good answer. I see like a little arm punch. Good answer, little buddy. Good answer. Do it and you will live. Verse 29, looking for a loophole. Looking for a loophole. He asked, um, yeah, just how would you, Jesus, like define neighbor? So Jesus answered by telling a story, which Jesus often does. He'll go into a parable. He says, there once was a man, this man many scholars would believe would be a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. And the Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the religious man. It's interesting how oftentimes religion will cause us to avoid broken humanity. Verse 33, it says, A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. One of the things the Holy Spirit put on my heart is that we as a church would see the conditions of humanity and our hearts would go out to our neighbors. So he gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging up his wounds. One translation would say they poured oil and wine on his wounds. Then he left, lifted him onto his donkey led him to an inn and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take good care of him. And if it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you when I, when I make my way back. So he says, what do you think? Which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? Now notice now this religious scholar, if you will we'll unpack this, but there was such um, political, there was such racial tension, he couldn't even muster up to say the Samaritan man. His response is, well, the one who treated him kindly. So Jesus said, go and do the same. I want to speak to you today as we examine the parable of the Good Samaritan, as we look to this teaching of Jesus, as we look to this encounter that this religious lawyer had with Jesus, um, and the statement that stuck out to me is, I think, where a lot of our culture is leading us right now. And here's the title of our talk, Looking for a Loophole. 
We are in such a time where we are looking for loopholes in who we are to love and to not love. This has seeped into our churches. There's an us versus them. There's a we versus they. And Jesus tells us to love our neighbors. So God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Father, I pray that you would return us to the simple fact of love, that we would be the kind of church that is marked by love, that when people hear or they meet people from Lighthouse Church, they would say that is a community that loves us, that cares for us, that helped me in my times of need. And so, Father, today I pray that through an encounter with the living God, that you would lead us to a place that we love our neighbors in response to the love that we have received. And so, Father, I ask that you speak to us for your church is listening. I ask that you give us ears to hear your voice, Father, for the voice of a stranger we will not recognize in Jesus' name. So, Father, speak. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I, many of us in the first service, first gathering we had today, were pretty honest. We're going to see how honest we are here. Anybody enjoy looking for loopholes and ways around things? Okay, like I love a good deal. I love like a, a good clearance rack and I always try to find some type of loophole to make the thing on the clearance rack even cheaper than the price listed on the clearance rack. I love to look for loopholes. Our culture, we love to look for loopholes. I'll, I'll use my kids uh, as an analogy. Why? Because it's easier to talk about them than it is about me. And so my, my, my kids, I've got my son in two weeks will be seven years old. My daughter is six years old and my baby daughter is four years old. Okay, so pray for your pastor. We are busy, okay? Um, if you come into my house um, any given day of the week, um, you will observe that my house looks like a tornado came through the inner dwellings of where we reside. My kids' toys are absolutely everywhere. I mean, in every room, you step on Legos, you break Barbie's head. I mean, you it is a war zone of toys. Now, I'm not mad at that. Why? Because the reason we got toys is so that they would be played with. And I'm glad my kids are playing with the toys. Now, my kids are cool to, to, to play all day up until the point where mom and or dad will say, it's time to clean up. And it's on that statement that my kids' personalities come through. My son, he starts to kind of do this. He slowly tiptoes back. He tries to remove himself from the situation and exit the scene very quietly and sneak away as if nobody will notice his absence. <laughs> and if he responds with the line, he will say, Dad, those are mostly Barbies, and you know I don't play with Barbies. <laughs> it's my son. And so he'll retract. And my middle daughter, she's pretty good. Her, her loophole is she will typically get right to work at cleaning because she has learned that because of the delay from her brother and her baby sister that we will stop her so that the others can be involved in cleaning. So her thing is she's going to jump right to it. She's going to start cleaning up real quick. And we're going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You get a cookie. <laughs> and then there's my baby. Now my baby... Um, she's all over the place, okay? And so I'm going to give you an example. Like yesterday, they were fighting because of the cleaning up of the toys, and so we sat them down. We got this bench behind our couch. We sat them down, and the other two are sitting. The baby is doing flips back and forth over the couch, to which she responds, and she screams at us, Ah, I can't clean right now. And we're like, what? My stomach hurts. I'm tired and I'm hungry. I can't, I don't have, I'm physically unable. <laughs> and so she has this excuse and she, she will push and push and push and push. She gets it from her mom and push and push and push. <laughs> Until finally our souls become vexed. No, I'm kidding. We make them clean up. But it's interesting, like, like, like our, our, our culture, that's a fun way to describe it. They're looking for a way out of doing a, the, the thing that they don't want to do. Um, we, we do this oftentimes. Like, th this idea is so ingrained in our American culture. Like, like, let's take dieting for an example. We look for loopholes in our diets all the time. You got things like, 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 like diets and workouts. You got a tea. You got a tea that you can drink that's supposed to make you fit by drinking the tea. I don't got to change my other stuff, so if I just drink that tea every day, I can look like that. 
If I just do eight minute abs, I can be shredded like that one day. You got friends, friends who will go unnamed to protect their identity. Uh, but, but have experience with this keto diet. You heard of this? This one, if you do the keto diet and it's working for you, it's probably because you're doing it right. Well done. I have met people, I would just say that, we'll, we'll, we'll generalize it, that, that have, have done this diet and, and like we'll, we'll eat and, and it will be like processed bologna with cheese sauce on it. And they're like, it's keto. No carbs. I mean, it's just, and I'm like, that looks like the most unhealthy thing that you can absolutely, but it's keto. So their loophole is it's an, a way to enable them to keep their unhealthy habits and not do the thing that they know that they need to do. Now, I'm going to give you the premise of the message, the thesis, the thought that, that we're going to go and I'm going to press into today. And here's the forewarning. Um, I'm going to push buttons today pretty hard. Um, I actually, I'm going to allow the text to push the buttons and Jesus to push the buttons because we live in such a time and such a world where our world is so divided and we think Jesus is here or Jesus is there. And I think Jesus is, is at the table with a glass of wine saying, let's come and have a seat and let's talk about this. And so I'm going to push a little bit today and, and it's going to lead us, I believe, what the Holy Spirit told me is to a deeper place of love. So let me give you the, the, the point and the point is this. Stop looking for loopholes and be the church and let's love our neighbors. Stop looking for loopholes and let's be the church and let's love our neighbor. But who, who, who exactly Jesus is our neighbor? Let's talk about this today. Well, we read this story and maybe when we, we, we in, in the elementary teachings, maybe for those of us who grew up in church, we hear this or even in parents, we'll, we'll use this sometime to resolve a fight with our children, right? You got to love your neighbor, love your brother and sister, you know, come together. And we, we, we hear this, but there is so such a richness to this text that is easily to miss when we don't understand the context of what is taking place culturally in this text that we read today. So, so in this like, like, like deceptively simple story that Jesus uh, unpacks for us about this good Samaritan, we are vicariously experiencing nearly 1,200 years of anger, of hostility, of racial divide, of religious divide, all the way back to the time of Moses. And so people groups have not gotten along. People groups have, have, have despised each other. Uh, th there are, are certain portions of society in this time that are even outcast, like, like do not go near that person. Okay, and so there's this, th this ranking, and, and it's in this story that this religious lawyer asked Jesus to define who his neighbor is. And I like, 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 let's just, just, just help you understand just culturally maybe a little bit the characters in the story, the people in the story that Jesus used and how that would have pushed some buttons at that time, especially to this religious lawyer, this religious lawyer that's asking this question, well, just who is my neighbor? Jesus says, well, there was a priest. And if you understand culturally at this time, the priests were like, like the center of society. The priests were the uppity ups. The priests had the nicest houses, uh, typically up on hills that would overlook communities. They were the most esteemed in this culture. After the priest came these Levites. These Levites were basically, uh, I would call them interns to the priests. Okay, so they are religious guys, not necessarily as important as the priests, but they would have been the next layer of society. Then after, after we, we, we have the, the, the Levites, then in this, this culture, you would have had the Jews, the Jewish people. After the Jewish people would have been like the tax collectors, the sinners, the outcasts, and then on the outer rings of that, we finally get to the Samaritans, the outside of the outside. As a matter of fact, in this culture, the only people worse than the Samaritans to believe would have been the Gentiles. So, so the idea of, of even this parable being titled the Good Samaritan, as the religious lawyer is hearing that, he has no concept of a Good Samaritan because culturally that was not a thing. So we hear the story and it gives us all like the, 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 you know, the feel goods. And yeah, let's just go out and love. But you have to understand the tension that Jesus is pushing into in their time by the characters he walks in and, and talks about in this parable and the story that he shares. You have to understand that many scholars would also believe that the guy that was beat up was a Jewish guy. And the, 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 the Jews and the Samaritans especially had so much, let's just call it beef, that they did not like even the existence of one another. 
So this religious lawyer, like, let's go a little bit deeper and look upon this because there's some questions I think that, that, that the characters in the story are asking the religious lawyer what he's doing, what he's looking for. He's looking for a way out of obeying what he knows. He, he responded to the answer of, of, of what is it to, 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 to inherit eternal life. And he goes, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is like, well, well, that's awesome. Well done. And then he goes, well, just who is my neighbor as a way out to not love those he would disagree with or to not love those he felt higher and more esteemed than? And then you get to these robbers. The mentality of these robbers would have been, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. There's a thought in that in our culture right now, that what's yours is mine, and I'm going to come in and take it. Then you get to the mentality of these priests and the Levites, and, and, and in their mind, it was, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. And then you hear about the good Samaritan, and he says, what's mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. So the question that we must answer today is, who will we be as a church? What attitude and what mentality and what posture will we take as it pertains to loving our neighbor? Will we try to, to, to creatively, strategically look for ways out of loving our neighbor? Will we look for ways to exploit and take advantage of people who are in need? Will we look to keep all that we have as our own and saying it's mine and this is only mine? Or will we take what God has blessed us with and say, God, we are called to help establish your kingdom on this earth and I will do all that I can to help better humanity. That's the posture. So I want to give you just a few thoughts today. A few thoughts as it pertains to this text. And I told you I'm going to push your buttons uh, today. And so we're going to allow God to do that and stir our hearts. And so I want to give you just, just a few thoughts today as it pertains to loving our neighbor. The first thought I want to give you as it pertains to loving our neighbors better is this. Ask questions to genuinely learn. Ask questions to genuinely learn. There is um, such a... a um, uh, a rise, I would say, a spirit right now where uh, you can go on Facebook any given day of any given hour and you will see questions that are being asked. But the whole idea is we're not asking questions to actually hear. We're asking questions to stir the pot. We're asking questions to test other people. Yeah. You remember like, like, like verse 25, right? Just then the religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Another translation would say, a question to trap Jesus. So he says, teacher, what must I do to be saved? Let me, let me say it this way. You know that face you make when you're asking somebody a question and you're trying to make them look foolish because you know they messed up? <laughs> I'll wait. You ask your question, you just got that face that's like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I know I'm right. You're wrong. Let me hear how wrong you are. We're trying to make other people look foolish. And so we're not even asking questions to genuinely learn about each other anymore. Like, like we don't genuinely care in the most part for one another. We just kind of want to stir the pot and add to the division. And meanwhile, we've got the world asking, where's the church? Yeah. I do this all the time to my wife. She does it to me as well. It's a kind of a fun game. Cooking and driving. Okay, I told you, I'm a bad driver. I will drive past the exit that I have exited for a thousand times in my life. Going home, I'll drive right by, and my wife, she'll just look at me, she'll give me that face, she'll go, where are you going? <laughs> she knows I missed the exit, but she wants me to admit that I missed the exit. So I say, we're taking the scenic route home. <laughs> and then like, I, when we're cooking, I got a couple of credits for cooking in school and so my wife will be cooking something and I'll just come in and I'll say what you making wait you added what into what she's like yeah I'm just kind of experimenting with my own recipe but I said but when you do that you add that to that here's what happens did you know <laughs> uh, and I know this is this is fun but what we're it's it's a funny game but what we're doing Essentially, and this is what culture is doing, you're trying to make each other look foolish. Yeah. We, we, we care more about making somebody that we don't agree with look foolish than we actually do caring about them. Yeah. Now, let me just, just, just say it this way. Um, uh, trying to make others look foolish 
only makes you look foolish. The Bible has a whole lot to say about the foolish and wise. As a matter of fact, it, it, it talks about in Scripture that there's really three types of people in the world. Evil people, wise people, and foolish people. Very few are evil, very few are wise, and most of us are foolish. Proverbs 10, 19 says it this way. It says, in the multitudes of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. You ever been in like a room or a meeting and like the person that's oftentimes the quiet one, they're taking it all in. But when that person speaks, it's kind of like the whole room leans in. Something about wisdom, restraining itself. Proverbs eleven twelve 12 says, He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. Proverbs 17, 27 says, He who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Proverbs 17, 28, the very next verse, Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. The Bible will also tell us what to be quick to listen and slow to. It's different than the world looks like. Because our world right now, we're really quick to speak. We got a whole lot to say on everything. If we want to get to a place of loving our neighbor, and if we genuinely do have questions and we genuinely care for the people we're asking questions, take the time and listen. And don't just be ready with all your blog posts to respond to the questions that they ask. Genuinely. Take some time and listen because I care about you. And I want to know what your thoughts are. I got people in my life of, of, of different, different backgrounds, different cultures, and, and, and who are preachers, who pastor great churches, and we don't agree on everything. I, 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 like, like, it, it baffles my mind sometimes how they can have a stance on this, but I still love them. I, I still, though we may not agree on everything, I care about them. You can have a disagreement and still care about people. Don't let the world lie to you that because we can disagree on something, doesn't that, 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 that has to be the thing that divides us. Like we've got families and homes that are being destroyed over some stupid stuff right now. Like the fact that, 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 that me being right is more important than my marriage. The fact that me being right is more important than loving my neighbor. What are we a disciple of? Go to the second point. I told you I was going to push a little bit. God bless you. <laughs> second thought is this. That genuine love has no loopholes. Genuine love has no loopholes. What was the, the, the religious lawyer doing? Verse 29, looking for a loophole. He said, and uh, just how would you define neighbor? How would, how would you define neighbor? And he obviously pushed into over 1,200 years of tension and pain and divide and talked about this story of this man being the most outcast from society, helping and loving somebody that was in need. How would somebody be good? Because we don't see them as good, but they're helping this person in need, and that's who Jesus uses to push into this? Here's just the thought I want to give you. Like, let's, let's, let's care for people more than we care about being right. Like, even as it pertains to, to theology and, and life, like, there are essential truths that we hold on to, essential truths that unify us as the body of Christ, that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, that God is the creator, that he has existed from the beginning of time. He is all the fullness of it, being the deity that is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. There are some essentials that we agree upon. But there's also things in Scripture that we can have disagreements on that are not essential to our salvation. So we can have different wings and different agreements on things, but when we talk about the essentials, but here's the problem. We have entire people groups and, and things that are being divided over non-essential issues. And we're, we're not unifying around some of the essential truths. Like, okay, so I told you I was going to push. So here, let, let me go here. 
So let's put ourselves in this lawyer's shoes for a minute. Let's step into this religious um, uh, lawyer's um, position, the question, and we're asking Jesus. Think about this. We're in a conversation with Jesus, looking into the eyes of love, the eyes of mercy, the eyes of grace, the eyes that so radically changed our lives. We're staring into his eyes. We say, well, just who is our neighbor? And Jesus goes into the story, and he talks about this man that was beat up on the side of the road. Now, what if, as we ask that question today, we walk by and we read a text where Jesus would say, well, that individual is wearing a red Make America Great Again hat, but they deserve to get beat up. They shouldn't have been wearing that label. Then we come on the other side, and Jesus might tell the story this way in today's American culture. You've got an individual who's beat half to death, and he has his Biden build back America mask on, but he deserved it. He deserved it. That's what he gets. And the fact that many Christians would relate with one of those two sides and not love our neighbor, Jesus would have some correction to his church. And so the, 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 the Spirit of God, when you go and you look at the teachings of Jesus, to be a Jesus follower is to love others out of the love that we have received, to get past some of our differences and disagreements, to genuinely care for one another. Ephesians 4, we'll say it this way. And before I read this, here's, here's part of the tension. And this is, this is what's happening with a lot of us. Um, there, there's intersections in life that happen in our faith, in, in, in growing in our relationship with Jesus, where the teachings of tradition are now intersecting with the truth of Jesus. So it, we, we have this great intersection of some of the traditions I've been taught, but when I examine that through the lens of the truth of Jesus in Scripture, there's an intersection taking place, and now we're in a great identity crisis to say, what am I going to follow, my traditions or truth? We don't know what to do with that. And I would venture to believe that you never arrive on that journey, which is why I talk about getting on your knees and spending time with God every single day, opening up this book, reading it, spending time in prayer, listening to worship, because there are things in my life and in my flesh that every single day are being confronted with some traditions that, wait a second, aren't always lining up with truth. And I am first and foremost a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is the truth of his word that is the guiding light unto my path. It is what matters the most in obeying in all of our lives. So we get to a text like Ephesians 4.32. It says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. John 13, 34, this is, again, one of the most famous passages in Scripture. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this, by the love you have for one another. All will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So our time right now as a church in our world to take our rightful place to be light bearers of Christ is so prime. But we are taking some of the hooks and bait of Satan to jump into this, this, this bait that is looking more and more like the world. And so we've got the world scrolling through our Facebook posts and they're saying, well, where's the church? Because the church people are fighting. And we got a front row seat to the church people fighting. And this looks just like what our, 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 our what news sources we go to. This looks just like what our world is saying. And we are countercultural to the world. We have a love that transcends, a love that goes far beyond what is happening, the divisiveness and fear that is gripping our society. We have a love, a perfect love that casts out all fear, a perfect love that unifies people. And so Jesus says, you want to be my disciple? Love your neighbor. But is my neighbor that, that, yes. Is your, my neighbor, yes. Genuine love has no loopholes. Third, third thought I want to give you is this. Help 
without expecting something in return. I mean, it is really easy to serve people who can do something for you. But there's something, like even in this text, the Samaritan knew that the wounded man may never help him in return, and yet he pressed in and helped him because he knew it was the right thing to do. He just, because this man can't do anything for me. He's, he's half dead with no money, has just been robbed of everything. But I see a need. And though this might be a Jewish man, and though he might have his thoughts about me and my perspective and my background and where I come from, I'm going to show up and I'm going to get my hands dirty and I'm going to serve this man. Amen. Who can do nothing. The attitude and the posture of our service church is important. Like, like, like being a good Samaritan in today's culture and society, I would say is probably just as tough as it was then. Like, it, it, it's challenging because we get so wrapped up in our own lives, our own schedules, our own excuses. And the attitudes in which we serve with need to be purified again. Look at the attitudes. You, you, you examine this. The, the, the expert in religious law here is conversating with Jesus. The attitude that was this, that the wounded man was a subject to discuss. Which that's part of what religion does. We, we can go and we can see some problems, but we're going to stand back. We're just going to discuss it and debate it. The robbers, the robbers saw the wounded man as someone to exploit. Oh, in this challenge time, who can I take advantage of? The religious men, which is oftentimes what religion does, saw the wounded man as someone to be avoided. Scripture says they stepped to the other side or they angled themselves in a different walking path to avoid almost as if I don't see it, but I do see it. But if I act like I don't see it, it's not there. Listen, just because you're acting like you don't see a problem, it is still there. Yeah. <laughs> the innkeeper, the innkeeper that, that, that they brought this man to saw the wounded man as a human being, a customer to care for. And the good Samaritan saw the wounded man as a human being to be cared for and loved on. And Jesus, he found everyone in this story worthy to die for. From the religious, to the innkeeper, to the robbers, to the religious Levites and priests, to the Samaritan, everyone in this story was worthy of him giving up his life. Tells us in Luke chapter 6, 35, just a few chapters earlier, Jesus, his own teachings would say, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind and to be and, and, and unthankful, or he it, for sorry, let me read this. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. What? Wait, who's our God? He's kind to the unthankful and evil. So not only is he my savior, but he's my example. How do I be kind to the unthankful and evil? That's hard. I mean, hard enough loving my neighbor. Now I've got to go on and love the unthankful, love the evil. One part of the scripture will say, turn the other cheek, huh? Fourth point I'll give you. Band will join me. We're going to bring it to Jesus. I'll, I'll show you. There's, there's the gospel in this. I'm going to show you. Fourth thought I want to give you is, is very, very simple. Be a doer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Listen, the priests and the Levites were very educated and they knew the word, but the disconnect was that they did not live out the word. Meaning he knew the right response and the answers to say, but their life did not back what was coming out of their mouth. James talks about this in, in, in James 1, 22 to 25. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. 
But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So be a doer of the work. I'm looking at this and when you go and you study the teachings of Jesus, I don't know about you, but I find the teachings of Jesus extremely challenging to follow and live by. Why is that? Like when you go and, and, and you look, you can take the, this rich young ruler. Well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what must I do? He, he says, sell it all. Well, I worked really hard for that. This man, you mean I got a this religious lawyer? I got to love somebody who's so far less than me? You read these teachings of Jesus and you're like, wow, what, what is it about the teachings of Jesus? Here's what he's doing. In every teaching of Jesus, he's bringing you closer to him, which is leading you to the end of yourself. Because in order to be a light bearer of Christ Jesus, I need not look like me, but I need to look like the spirit that resides on the inside of me. And when I read the scriptures and I look at it and I say, I don't know how I'm going to do that, Jesus is like, I know a guy, come here, which is essentially what he's doing because I know, I know most of us right now, the question that we're asking, how do I love my neighbor? How do I love my enemy? I'm going to show you this because you can so clearly see the gospel in the story that Jesus shares. And I, I want to just, just make this thought because I think the way that we do this is we realize that Jesus is the good Samaritan. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Jesus, he is the good Samaritan. Think about the story and the progression of it. There was a man who was robbed and beat up, and left half dead. What does the enemy come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. And then religion passed by. And religion overlooked me in my pain and my brokenness. And then there was a Samaritan who came on a horse, who got off of his high horse, came down, and he bandaged my wounds. His translation will say he put oil and wine on it. You can go and you can study the scriptures and you can understand that the oil, Psalm 147, and wine is indicative of the blood of Jesus that has cleansed and covered us and the oil of the anointing of God that gives us the ability to heal up and press on. So he sees us. He bandages us up. And then what's he do next? He puts us on his horse. He switches seats with us. He who knew no sin became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God. So here I am, he met me down in my brokenness as I was beat up and he healed me up and then put me up on a horse. And like the story could end there. Like Hollywood, you think about this story in Hollywood? Wow! I see like the horse just kind of like galloping off into the sunset. But there's more to the story. It's interesting that, that, that Jesus would choose to include this portion about the inn. Now in order to understand the importance and what I felt from the Holy Spirit the inn represents, you have to understand the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. You have to understand that this was a long journey, a very treacherous journey, it's a very steep journey. And oftentimes what would happen as people would take this journey, what would happen is the people that were taking this journey would oftentimes get tired, they would get weary, they would be at places that, that, that they physically felt like they could not keep going, and then that's when the robbers, the thieves would come in and pounce is when the individuals were weak. So what's happening on this journey is you'd see several inns at strategic spots because what happened was there was probably a businessman that saw an opportunity to say, hey, we can protect people that at these spots where they get tired and they're weary in this journey, we can have a safe place for them to stay and to get healed up so that they're able to go and continue in this journey. So why would Jesus consider including that into this story? Because the story about him going away on a horse is great. But there's something about when, when he sends them on this journey and then what's he do? He, he comes to the inn with the man. And he says, here's a couple of coins. This should take care to get him healed up. 
And oh, by the way, if there's any more debt that's needed to make sure he's fully up, I will repay this when I come back. Let me just ask you, is there not a second coming of Christ Jesus that's coming back to make up for whatever lack there may be? So I want to suggest for your imagination today that the inn just might be the church. The inn just might be these places that are strategically placed along journeys in life where people, broken humanity, is suffering. And there they are, beat up, and there we are as the church who, as Jesus has rescued them, we can be the inn that comes alongside them and says, come on, I don't care how broken, I don't care how beat up you are, you belong here, I'm going to love you, I'm going to disciple you in the ways of the Lord, I'm going to point you to the one who has rescued me. So how do I, how do I continue in this journey? How do I love my neighbor? Here's the key. I never stop seeing myself as the man beat up. Because when I talk about where Jesus met me, in my brokenness, in my shame, in my pain, from all the stuff that the devil had came and stolen from me, and as I watched religion and church hurt pass by, what no man could do, Jesus could do. And what did Jesus say? He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so now I've been brought into a family, a community, an inn that has wrapped their arms around me, who has healed me up, who has set me on my way so I can continue in this journey of life. Might it just be, church, let us never forget that we were the ones that were beaten and broken and he rescued us and he enabled us to get to the end and so what's pastor saying we will be that end what's our position on our church and where we're at on this we're going to keep loving God with everything inside of us with our heart with our soul with our might and we will love our neighbor as ourselves. no loopholes no 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 qualifications on who is and who isn't our neighbor come on come on we will be the rescue mission that is the church of Jesus Christ which is Stand to your feet and give God the glory. Come on, let's respond and worship today to our King.